Welcome to Reality Bites Radio. Uh, sorry about the delay, the usual connection problems, but uh, seems to be the norm nowadays with Skype and uh, Mr. Bill Gates. But there you go. Uh, we've got our guest tonight, Alan Watt, uh, making a return visit. And um, we're going to spend a little time tonight talking about the the authors uh, who have uh, shaped, influenced, uh, call it what you will, uh, written the, the history in advance, uh, is another way of putting it, I suppose. Um, you there, Alan? Yes, I'm here. Yep. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, um, you've spoken many, many times about uh, Russell, Wally Huxley, Julian Huxley, George Bernard Shaw, H.G. Wells. Um, do, do you want to go through these, the, the role has been in the past in the books they've written? Yeah, it, it wasn't um, it, it wasn't just in their names or who, it's their, their era is so important because they came out of uh, the 1800s into the 1900s. The 1800s, of course, was uh, the rise of academia in a lot of countries in Europe, uh, where you had a leisure class and they had more time to, to look at society in general. It was also the time of Marxism and the mass man and the masses, etc. Uh, the elite were concerned on how to control the masses, as they called them, and how to use the masses efficiently so they had time and motion men going into the factories and don't do it this way, do it that way, just to save time and make you work it like part of the machine. And uh, a big industrial revolution era uh, and um, heavy industry, squalor in a lot of the, the, the cities, these work cities. Uh, but uh, you had also this group of intelligentsia watching and studying all of this in academia and the higher universities and you also had, uh, what do we do with all of these people in the future? That was one of their main concerns uh, on behalf of those who already ruled, of course, in places like Britain. And so out of uh, their, uh, their own class, you might say, they, they, they hired some or put them to work on studying human nature. It was a big time for studying human nature and uh, all classes, etc. What drives mankind, what drives the individual person, psychodynamics, that kind of thing. And, and then, of course, um, you, you, the, the thing was, how do we control the public from... Because the elites were living, much like today, the, the, gulf, the gulf between the rich and the poor was, was, was massive. And they were always afraid of the people rising up or rebelling, etc. One way to stop, of course, was to keep them involved in foreign wars, always fighting an enemy. And out of that, of course, came the idea that you had with... Uh, with George Orwell, uh, a perpetual war idea. And at the same time, too, they knew at the top, uh, as far as back as the early 1800s, that the Industrial Revolution, especially in Britain, wouldn't last forever. What do we do with all these people afterwards? How do we control them? What kind of society do we want to give them? What kind of culture to make them well-behaved, orderly, etc.? And yet, uh, uh, I don't see it as a clash between right wing and left wing or aristocracy and socialists. I see it as, as basically a, a, a working together of the two systems. That's what's often confusing to people who think it's two different systems. It's not. Because we know, for instance, the capitalists ran and funded the, the communist revolution from the West. We have all the data who was behind it. The top bankers involved, they fund it into existence and even fund them all through the, the whole Soviet era. In fact, they could even feed themselves. And most of the food uh, grains came from Canada and the States right up into the, the, the 80s, you know, early 80s. So you have uh, this intelligence of studying humanity, and the science of the mind was coming in big at that time too. Anthropology was as well. And, of course, evolution was tied into it. So you have this, this combination of Marxism, evolution, uh, man, the nature of man, the kinds of man, uh, his, his, his complete uh, uh, moral or social behavior, social structures, and how to control on behalf of an elite who is always terrified of losing control. And so uh, you find that uh, the, 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 the big organizations that came into being, such as the Royal Institute for International Affairs in Britain, which owns the Council on Foreign Relations, that's all parts of the Council on Foreign Relations um, across the world, and also the Trilateral Commission, which they also set up, all came from the same source. Plus, they set up the Fabian Society to run the left wing in, in Britain and for parts of the world. 
The Fabian Society that brought in George Bernard Shaw as a founder, H.G. Wells and others, um, their job was to try and take the, to get the working guys behind them to bring in what they thought was their world. Uh, but of course it's not. As, as for the, the, the scientific control of society, you'll find that all through communist works. Scientific control, how to create the perfect Soviet, etc. Or socialist, it doesn't matter what you call it, it's, it's a subordinate happy creature on behalf, of, they're there to serve the, the, the general good or the elite, which is really the system. <laughs> So um, they, they, they brought that out too. They also set up the London School of Economics. So these are top bankers funding all of this for the left wing to bring in, uh, to get the public to go along thinking they're going to bring in democracy in their system. In other words, they were conned. And when you look into the, to the, to the personalities of the guys who ran the left wing, uh, they're really quite fascinating, like H.G. Wells. H.G. Uh, Wells' story uh, as something else again, because he, his parents didn't do too well. They had a, a second-hand shop for a long time. The dad was a bit of a drunk, and his dad at that time uh, was so uh, it was so bad into the sauce, etc. They'd, they'd, he would hire himself out for professional cricket players, which was big at that time under, over the old empire. And he'd be gone for long periods of time, but he was like a, a hand on the pitch, you might say. And um, he's with his mum most of the time. And eventually got so bad that his mother went into service into a very upper-class fa- uh, crust family. And because of that, he started to identify with the upper-crust family. And he developed their habits and traits and their opinions, which was a terrible fear of all the factory workers walking past their windows every day. Uh, they despised them. Really, and that and H. G. Wells actually despised the working class because he was terrified of being amongst them, or being one of them, in fact. And so he devoted his his life, you might say, to serve, I would say, his betters, the ones he wanted to identify with. So he was one of them. Another one too, of course, was George Bernard Shaw, and George Bernard Shaw, and has got a very mystical background. Once again, it's a bit similar to a kind of dad that wasn't there. I don't really know. It's actually a lot of speculation who his dad was, and his mother who brought him into England. And but there's always money there to back him, give him good education into the particular uh, style of novels, especially that he was going to write. And then you had uh, people like uh, Lord Bertrand Russell, who uh, it was a hereditary title, the, the lordship. They'd been, they'd been in the British government from when the merchant bankers went in in the 1700s. He was descended from that branch. And Russell himself, his parents died very young, so once again, uh, he didn't have the father figure, etc. And he's brought up by a, an old aunt. It supposedly, this is the, the myth that goes along with it. But um, they all had this, this, you might call it a, a blunting of affect, uh, an inability to bond properly with people, in a sense. But again, to make up for that, they had, what, what you'll get at boarding school often, you'll have this... Um, uh, need to dominate your peer group. They all had that same ego of domination, which comes, it seems, with blunting of affect, absent parents or no parents at all sometimes. So these guys all worked together. Initially, uh, some of them wrote novels. That was a big idea to change society with through emotion. Uh, it still, still is today, by the way. Uh, novelists today in Canada, Britain and elsewhere get paid extra money. I don't know if people know this. Same with writers for TV, for dramas and movies. Uh, so they get money given by the Department of Culture to put in the latest PC updates, the political correct updates. This way, it doesn't matter if it fits into the story. They'll bung them in there and it just seems out of place sometimes. But it's to get the, the repetition, the points across of how they want to change your way of thinking, the viewer or the reader. Uh, and so there we are thinking to, to for a better society. And it's a con, because it's not a better society. It's a more socially ordered society. So Russell's uh, idea was to go in through philosophy. And he took what was in vogue at that time was mathematics as well, combined with philosophy, to create a new kind of language. He said the perfect language was mathematics, uh, because it can't lie. It's either, it's either correct or it's wrong. And uh, he was working on a form of controlling society, not just through, but through language in a sense. 
the whole study of language is overlooked by most people. You can sway people naturally by speech. You can use rhetoric and emotion, uh, but you can also use uh, many other techniques with it as well. But if you look at a computer, basically, if, if you construct a sentence in a certain way, uh, and you you construct and, and guide a debate a certain way, you can direct the outcome of the opinion of that debate for the listeners or the viewers to, to, to watch and, and take in themselves. This is done all through uh, news media today and, and television presentations. It was perfected perfected in Britain at the Tavistock Institute and worked, they, worked, uh, they worked closely with the BBC. And, and that's how you get most of the public get their opinions from, from television. It's worked perfectly well. So all these guys work together on, on ways of controlling and guiding the mass of society into a new order that they'd be easier to control on behalf of those above them, the way they want them to be. Now, there's nothing new in that. From the ancient times, too, conquerors would come in and, and, and mandates by decree and by the use of force and terror initially. Uh, the new system, here's what you say, here's, here's what you can say, here's what's lethal to say, etc., etc., etc. And then, of course, it becomes normal once the parents teach that to the first generation of children. Then they teach it and it goes on as normal, it becomes normal. Uh, but they're still doing it today, of course, and people are completely ignorant of this fact. But you'll find if you read the topics of, of, of the books they put out, even the fictional ones, um, that uh, Huxley put out, of course, in Brave New World. It didn't come out of the blue. It's because he was sitting with top world panelists who were, tra- were employees by big foundations uh, to, f- to, to direct, help direct a culture for the future. And he came out with Brave New World. He, he got the idea by listening to all the topics from his brother, Julian Huxley, who was working with the United Nations later, eventually. Before that, they worked in the League of Nations. And he came out with uh, the Brave New World concept of the ideal placid society. Because early psychiatry in those days, early psychiatry, which came out, by the way, as part of the social control. That's the purpose of psychiatry. If for folk who don't know it, if you go into the history of the World uh, Psychiatric Association, the Freudian School, all the people who were involved in it, they've got all, all got something awfully, awfully amazing in common. And it's very, very uh, obvious too. But... Um, they wanted to change the world. They were revolutionaries. Uh, change the, the, the minds of the public, alter their morality, in fact, for their ideal society. They initially thought they could get the children from the parents and the state would bring them up, the old uh, Plato idea, you know. Um, but, then this, but then after experimental schools that was run by guys like Bertrand Russell, he said, uh, we can get the parents to, to pay and be the economic providers for the children uh, it would be cheaper for the state uh, because within scientific indoctrination from a young age um, we give, uh, the state will give the new values to the child. Well that's well uh, that's as generations later it's all been done, it's perfected today. You know, the parents uh, parents trying to say anything to a child today or pass anything on, they've got to get a mouthful back from the child, you know. Um, so you're living at, where you are today is a construct of all these, these, this training intergenerationally to the present time from the early 1900s to the present. But um, what you'll find too, Aldous Huxley uh, went into um, non-fiction, like Doors of Perception. The idea was to break one generation, even though they could train the children to, uh, into uh, new moralities, etc., by the state. Um, they also had to break a generation completely so that that generation hopefully wouldn't marry at all. If it did, they'd be dysfunctional, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the, the idea was to get them on drugs. And so he and other ones were put out there to, to bring out uh, the, the drug uh, push for LSD, etc. The doors of perception was one of them. In the States, they brought out Timothy Leary, who came out after, what, 30 years. They declassified the documentation and said he was actually CIA. And, and by the way, so was Bertrand Russell during World War II. He worked for MI5. Uh, so did um, uh, all the other ones. Uh, George Orwell, he worked for MI5 during World War II. Um, uh, quite a few other ones too. So Arthur Kessler was part of that group too, MI5 during World War II. So th- these guys all worked together to bring a new, a new system, a new society 
And for those who don't know, they say, why would a a far right winger, a lord, be working with the far left, uh, like Kessler, etc.? And it's because it's meant to be that way. The ones at the top want a socialist type society run by scientific supervision from birth to death for everyone and everyone's to be monitored through their life. And these guys, by the way, wrote about a modern utopia, H.G. Wells, etc. And um, if you read all their, their books, you'll find it's all been done. It's all, pretty well all been done. The present culture you're going through today was advised by these guys. Right now, for, for the teenagers, what they're experiencing today, for their particular generation, was, was written and designed by these guys back then. And that's what folk don't understand, you know. They were authorized to do this. Yeah, yeah ab- absolutely. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll, the sound doesn't act great, so we're going. Welcome back to Reality Bites on the 10th of April. Uh, we've got Alan Watt on the line. Uh, hopefully, the sound's a bit better. Uh, Alan, you were talking about before the break about these uh, authors, the authorized um, scribblers, if you like. Uh, some, something struck me when you talked about um, Huxley and Brave New World. I mean, I don't know if many people have seen the, the film version. Uh, I mean, the, the acting in it is absolutely shocking. But uh, I thought I thought it was interesting that the head the head guy in the uh, in the in the culture at that time uh, was um, played by Leonard Nimoy, who of course is is as better known as Doctor Spock. And and we're talking about I mean the, the associations there obviously that uh, the the children in Brave New World and and Doctor Spock, and uh, and then something else you mentioned about um, things that are put into to scripts, especially in soap operas. I've heard you mentioned before. And there was a, a clip in Coronation Street uh, a month or so ago where one of the characters was talking about get, getting her child microchipped if she could so um, to stop them um, disappearing in the supermarket or something. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's all out there. And uh, the, the, the trouble with some of these books, not, not so much uh, Huxley and, and Russell to a large extent, but um, Wells and Shaw, I mean, they're hard going. You, you have to plough through them and, and you, you'll come along and, and you'll, you'll you'll find a little nugget in there somewhere, and you think, ah, yeah, there we go. But um, you, I've heard you mention so many times before that you're not meant to read these books. These books aren't for us. They're they're for um, the own their these guys' own own class of people uh, to go through. Yeah. Well, what it is, it's written on two levels. That's really what how it's done. Even their even their, their sci-fi is is written on two levels. One for the in-group who understand the premises getting put forth, but uh, and and then for basic entertainment for the rest of the public, you find most things are like that. Uh, if you take um, uh, you, you take um, Wells, for instance, he wrote a short history of the world, his version, and it was uh, it had eugenics in it. They're all eugenicists, all these boys, by the way. So the Soviets they were all into eugenics that that they could all be man could be improved through science, you know, remade. And, of course, then you find the other group, the Huxleys, doing the same thing, Brave New World, uh, etc. That was a big, big thing. And, of course, that was adapted into uh, uh, Darwinism, was, was adopted by Karl Marx. In fact, Marx wanted to, to give his, I think, his third edition uh, of his book and dedicate it to, to Darwin uh, because it, 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 he thought it bolstered the, his whole th- theory of evolution for man and the worker coming up to the top nonsense, which never, hasn't, will never happen in a world run by a clique with money. It won't happen. It, can, it can't ever happen, you know, that way. Until you completely change who runs the money, and I don't see why nations have to borrow a, a penny in the first place with the amount of taxes they bring in. But anyway, uh, getting back to these guys, you'll find, if you look at their, their books, they're awfully important because in the late 1800s, for instance, H.G. Wells uh, was given his start in writing uh, by uh, uh, Sir Thomas Huxley who was a pal of Charles Darwin. And he created what was called the Red Brick School. And he was funded by the foundations at that time, the Rothschilds, etc. And the idea was to to alter society's view of morality uh, by drama and fiction that would be really entertaining for the public to read. But to alter it, because monkey see, monkey do, that's how humans unfortunately are. And it's so easy to, to be directed by those who know what they're doing. And so he, he, he's actually pushing free love, he called it, back in the, 80, early, the late 1800s, in his early books, H.G. Wells, on behalf of this group uh, and all the other authors that were funded through the Red Ties School. So, and Red Ties were for revolution, for the world. 
And the Milner Group at that time, and uh, etc., and the Rhodes Foundation were involved in backing them as well. And they became the Royal Institute for International Affairs, Council on Foreign Relations. So uh, it's a very old system with many names done through centuries, in fact, continuing uh, to, to push towards their view of, of a, a wonderful future for themselves. Uh, and a, a passive population, but not just a population. Uh, they would breed a population up for war, that was well discussed, uh, and train them for war. That's why you had video games came out 20 years before Gulf War, or 10 years before Gulf War I. Uh, so the 10-year-olds would be 18-year-olds. They'd, they'd, be, they'd be the soldiers then. They'd kill without thinking, because it's all done on games, and it's very similar. They're all meant for the, for the military to, to become uh, depersonalized, in a sense. And so they did that. Uh, and then they would also depopulate when they didn't need them. And they all knew that when they got to their goal of a world order, uh, with their old goal, which was also uh, Marxian, because Marx talked about three trading blocks with many parliaments that would run the three blocks, three, three parliaments, uh, under a, a, a main parliament for the block and then a super governmental one. They all had the same idea, they all believed in the same thing. So uh, uh, that was all to get pushed through their books as well, and how destructive war would be. And at the same time, these guys who were pushing how destructive war would be were also propagandists for the wars when wars came along. I mean, H.G. Wells was employed by the Milner Group that ran Britain, by the way. These are the top bankers and so on to find ways to get young guys to, to volunteer for the army. They were going through so many <laughs> thousands a week uh, and who were getting killed off. And he came out with a white feather in a cap. That was the idea. So if, if, you'd, if, if you didn't join the army, you're, he, he said to the girl, the woman, through novels, if your man loves you and he's brave, he'll show it by going off to fight for his country. And, and, and if he doesn't, did you put a white feather in your cap? And so that's what, uh, that's what they did. He also was paid to come out with slogans like uh, the war to end all wars, you see. Uh, and in World War II, same sort of thing. He 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 revived the old the old old very old ancient idea of the Hun. He came up with the Hun as the enemy. He used terms like that, and he was paid to do that. And then in between the wars, he, he he's he's pushing on the consequences of wars and how you need a world order run by a super scientific elite. You see, so they, they all actually were doing the same thing. All, all these guys were doing the same thing, and. Um, if you really read their, their books, apart from pushing the drugs in the, in the, the 40s, 50s, and 60s, like, like uh, Doors of Perception, and etc., you, you'll find, and again, uh, uh, this idea that they took from the Frankfurt School, which worked with the Freudian School, and you've got to really study those two groups because they're really one group, by the way. And I really mean that. There's things behind what I'm saying you should really delve into. And, um, and see what their function happened to be. But they, they said that if they could, they, the, the, the problem with the European male uh, was that he, he, he was a, a violent character because he was sexually frustrated. That was the, that was the, the, the thing they came up with in order to dist- help destroy society so that they themselves could rule it. And that was the idea behind it. They could then rule it as a scientific elite through using psychiatry, etc., etc. It ties actually right in with Gerfek, where a child is to be monitored every month for its social opinions, for God's sake, etc. You see? Yeah, so you're, 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 you're just living a script right now. And I've lived this my whole life watching this, because I read this very young, all, the, all these books. And I saw them all coming into play in my own lifetime. So they wanted to destroy marriage, of course, because marriage... Uh, was the main enemy of government because couples become communities which stand up when the, the rights are getting taken away or whatever, you know. Uh, so you destroy all opposition. And once you're, everyone's an individual in their own little orbit, uh, helpless and drifting, then government's a boss. And, and that's what H.G. Wells said. He says, once we have that destroyed and there's no, no real community of people who have things in common, like marriage and families, then the government can talk right down to you as the individual and, and, and you're, you're terrified. No one's going to come around to help you. No one. There's no family. There's nothing. And that's, what, of course, what they put into, into um, George Orwell's 1984 when the screen talks to number so-and-so. Yeah, you, he says, you know, uh, you're helpless and you're terrified. 
So that, these, these groups all worked together from a, a higher source that guided them all into their particular areas. The other ones, like Bertrand Russell, were to push uh, the scientific, the non-fiction side of things and how to change society, again, along these same lines. Uh, and, and so they would take, as the novels were coming out to destroy, say, marriage and, and, and promote promiscuity, uh, Russell's books were coming out uh, knocking marriage and saying that man is not a monogamous creature, etc., etc. And therefore the state can take up the slack uh, and, and, and take care of the children, etc., etc. That's the idea of these big crashes came in, they were going to do. So everything worked together. Then the Frankfurt School that worked heavily with the, with the Freudian school, uh, in fact they're intertwined completely, at the end of World War II were given... Um, a special order. I think it was. I think it was. Uh, I, uh, it wasn't Eisenhower. It was um, uh, Eisenhower was involved, and he knew them. But the, the president of the United States, at the end, Truman, gave him permission to create a new society for the West, beginning in America. And um, in it, they would promote the, literally sexual sexual revolution, uh, all the communist things which people thought had been communist. Uh, and they would, they would give charge of the school to the Frankfurt School, the Macy Group. It's another group who were all the same people, by the way, the Macy Group, Franklin School, and, and the psychiatric uh, associations. And, and they would literally engineer a, a whole new type of human uh, by, by, all the, the, by using behaviorism and social indoctrination at school, etc., and massively through entertainment as well. They had meetings in Britain and the States to see if it should be done in Britain, as Britain is ahead, or the States, and decided the States, uh, because they had more money, more tax base, etc., uh, and, and Hollywood, etc., they could, they could actually do it better. Uh, Bertrand Russell worked with these groups, and these other, other um, major players, too, also worked with the same groups to bring in a new uh, system for, for the 1950s and 60s, uh, and so on. So it's quite interesting to, to, to see the what people thought was a generation in the 60s thinking this was their generation doing a revolution, a sexual revolution, all kinds of revolutions, and women's lib and so on. They thought it was all coming from themselves, but it was all guided from above by the, those with a different uh, uh, ending in, in mind than the one that the, the people who were going through the free sex and so on were, were having themselves. And we saw the, the disorder and, and destruction, etc. today. Until today, we're, we're burning up more... Uh, more babies than we're actually getting born. So we're being dehumanized uh, exactly as they wanted to. When you de- dehumanize any part of the human, where it's, where it's a so-called fetus, which is just a baby unborn, uh, or, or an elderly, uh, you're, de- you don't, you're, you're, realize you are putting yourself in a category that your life isn't, isn't worth as much either. And the state's starting to use that. Well, there's too many of you, you know, and we could make sure that everyone gets enough, etc., and um, and we're going to be in charge of giving you enough, or just enough. And you, you're going to stand up to you. Would have done, say, in the 1940s and 50s, uh, before they even started uh, pushing the abortion industry. You know. So as you become dehumanized, accepting all these things, and then and then it ends up uh, that you're dehumanizing yourself and and losing your self worth, which is exactly what Julian Huxley, the brother of Aldous, said at the United Nations. We're going to knock man off his pedestal and teach him he's just another animal. And not a superior being with some sacred right to live. Well, they've done that, and now it's time to go to the, to the next part of the kill, you might say. Yeah. Well, of course, of course. I mean, you, you talk about Julian Huxley. Of course, he was part of Planned Parenthood, and uh, and dehumanisation in terms of abortion. Uh, they're now burning aborted babies in uh, hospital furnaces uh, to use as heating fuel in, in Britain. Yeah. That's right, yeah. You, you collect them. I, I know someone who did it, and, and, uh, who actually worked in a, a, a hospital, in a, and he was often told for the scientific departments to go and get a, a bags of them, garbage bags of them. That's what they're putting in, they're putting garbage bags. And he, he would bring them down, and, and, and he would test them all for the fetal cells and do experiments on the tissue. Now it's a big business worldwide, of course, because the same guys who run all this, the, the psychiatric associations, the Frankfurt School, etc., are also in, in league with the big bankers, a lot more related, in fact, to the big bankers, but, but it's a big industry. So we are the business, you might say, yeah. Yeah, and they actually classified uh, aborted babies as waste, uh, and that's, that's how they classified it. Um, in terms of the 
the schools, of course, you've mentioned many times Bertrand Russell's special schools where he would uh, encourage promiscuity among children. Yeah. Uh, we've now got uh, Lord Walshaw uh, coming out and saying that uh, we have to take children to school at two years old for 10 hours a day. Uh, again, um, to, to indoctrinate them into the, the new normals of, of what's going to be in their, their generation. Uh, yeah. just, just today in uh, the Independent, I think it was, uh, Labour accuses government of dumbing down uh, the teachers not just the children, they dumb down the teachers first and then uh, the, the teachers just um, parrot off whatever they've been taught at the, the colleges they've gone to um, and we're, we're on a, a very, very um, swift downward spiral in terms of uh, education in inverted commas of, of, of all children across the, the whole western world and uh, beyond and you know it's um, we're almost in the, the, the brave new world scenario where we've got the, the alphas and betas and uh, they're all they're all designed to do specific jobs. And just last week I read out something where they were going to start um, messing around with the, the genetics of children to make them this, that or the other. Um, so there we are. I mean, we're, we're there, really. Oh, it's all there. And as I say, the whole point was uh, they had to take, do about two or three generations of, of dehumanisation to get us to accept it. Uh, dehumanization or say, oh well you know, uh, it's, just a, it's just a fetus and okay it's just the elderly, okay it's, it's just the, it's just the poor old folk are dying in the winter because they can't afford fuel uh, and, and, but you don't realise that you're putting yourself, <laughs> you, you are going down the scale there and, to the, and the furnace is going to get near near to you eventually and this is the whole intention, they believe at the top you can train man into, into anything and unfortunately they're pretty well right unfortunately they're using scientific techniques, never mind the chemical techniques too that we've all had, or injections, or inoculations, uh, the food, which is poisoned, it's just, <laughs> that's waste product you're eating there, most of it, uh, with lots of sauces in it, uh, to give it a taste. But uh, you are being poisoned down to it, and they, they know the effects of all of this. They knew the bisphenol estrogen mimicker back in the 1890s you know, in Germany, they knew what it did to humans. Uh, and they promoted all of that too. So there's nothing, uh, nothing is done by accident, believe you me. If anything happened to the human population that they didn't cause to happen, they would be on it like a shot and big money would be going in to find out what on earth's going on. Uh, so they're not putting big money into it and it's just, oh well, what can you do? Uh, you know it's intentional. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in, in terms of um, modern modern uh, day foundations, for want of a better word, uh, who do you know who's carrying on the work of these people in, in terms of, uh, is, is, are there any specific individuals who are, who are writing along the same lines to, to modernise this whole agenda or are there specific oh, you'll groups? Oh, you'll find it in, in all, all areas uh, if you get the books out uh, by those in, uh, in academia that put out, they'll put out their books uh, on, on neuroscience. Uh, they're now calling it neuroscience, which really is a combination of uh, uh, behaviorism, physical uh, changes, chemical changes, etc., biochemical changes to the brain they can do, uh, all of those things um, to cause a form of, of, of uh, evolution, social evolution for control purposes, of course. There's one in, in Canada, he's called uh, Persinger. Persinger, uh, Professor Persinger, uh, has got some things up on YouTube. And it's in Laurentian University, but he he's a typical guy involved in, in neuroscience, big funding, of course. He used to work with the U.S. government, probably CIA, uh, and uh, and now he's in Canada. But he he talks about the field theory. We're all in this, in this field of Wi-Fi, etc. He thinks it's wonderful, uh, and they know too. And, and they've known this since about the fifties and sixties that that the, the parallel waves they can carry on all the, these signals. Uh, even in the harp techniques too, they found that on very early research, uh, could alter the behaviour of the person that's been, uh, who's in the field itself. It says, now it, now it says it's wonderful. It says, you think about it, it says, we can all eventually go into this, you know, the internet of things where they, where they scatter whole cities with little microchips that, that go on buildings and clothing and everything constantly. Uh, and have a constant feed on everything and, and a field set up. It says, we can make you feel, it says, a, a, a person's hunger in Africa, he said, etc. Well, you can imagine the power they're talking about here. They can make you feel anything they want you to feel, all at the same time. There's power. And, and this guy, he thinks it's wonderful. 
So, which tells you where he's going with this and why he's going there and the kind of man he is and obviously who's behind him as well. We know who's behind these characters too for total control of society. So um, there's many like that, but academia is where you'll, where you'll find it today. That's why, I mean, every university in the States, and I think Canada too, most of them all take grants from, say, Rockefeller Foundation. But along with the grants becomes things to, just, to, to push and things that they don't want you to talk about at all. So they help set the curriculum in every university. Uh, and, and of course, the, the, once we come out of the university, apart from the ones you're going to bring in to the next generation of neuroscientific workers who think they're a step above the rest, because, ah, ha, ha, we know why you're behaving like this, but it won't happen to us, we're special. But uh, uh, you, you find that, that uh, academia is a big, big player in all of this today. Uh, most of the, re- the research is done through uh, grants given to the universities in, in specific areas. Now, whenever they did a, do a test on something or an investigation, where it's physical or psychiatric or whatever it happens to be, or involved in neuroscience, uh, they'll give out a thousand or more, maybe two thousand grants across the world to different universities, and they won't tell each university they're doing it. So you get the grant, you think, okay, our department is going to investigate this, this physical reaction. It could be a physical change or a genetic change. So you do all your little reports and you do it, take it as far as you can go. And then the thousand other universities across the world are doing the same thing under, under different names. They're not related to each other. And so all the, the data, that, that once they publish it, is fed up to the top. Now, who's at the top? The ones at the top are the big foundations that are collecting all of the data. They get a better, clearer picture of all the data coming in on research. And that's why they're way ahead of everybody else in science, any, every kind of science, even medical science. There's different levels of, of, of medicine, as there are the three levels of everything else, by the way. So we're run by private organizations that came out initially from the, the mercantile banking system. There were merchant bankers, there were money lenders, and so on, that, 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 that took over a long time ago what you thought was governments. Many of them took over governments and went into government initially, too, in the old days. And, and, and their idea was to bring in their society, as Professor Carl Quigley said, of bringing in a controlled society, perfectly controlled and, and placid, train them all for the specific tasks, uh, stabilize a population, decrease it, increase it, whenever you wanted to do so in different areas, and, and run it properly, as they said, properly. As they always use the word, do it properly, rather than this haphazard way of the individual deciding what he wants to do, if he wants to get married, if he wants to have children, do his own thing, and work at what he wants to do. That's what Gerfic, again, has to do with. And because they've, they've done it over, uh, say, about three generations, I'm talking about 20-odd years, and enough to have a, grow up to have a child, and then that child grows within their 20 odd years and marrying like a child. Over, over maybe 30 years, 40 years, they've, they've, in each generation, they've trained society so quickly to accept dehumanization. Oh, what's the problem about, about, uh, about being controlled to an extent that brings peace to the world, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Uh, and, and apart from that, too, they're already using these unified field theories uh, with massive Wi Fi experiments across whole areas. Uh, and they have all the studies done, what makes you tired, what makes you happy, which makes you all depressed at the same time, or even angry. Because uh, the military funded a lot of that too, to find that they can create more anger and, and aggressivity, aggressivity in the soldier a long time ago. So they, they, they've tried all this stuff on the public, they know it works. And you know yourself when you're talking to people, they're not responding as they should half the time. But they're, they're in a, a semi daze. Um, they can't break out of it because it affects them more than, than others. We're, we're all more or less susceptible to the same things, some more and, and some less, of course. But this is all being used today. Yeah, yeah it's, funny, it's funny you should say that because uh, on Tuesday, I think it was, I, w- I went into the office and my colleague was there and another guy, and every one of us felt absolutely depressed all, all yeah. at the same time. And the day before, perfectly fine. The day after, perfectly fine. But just that, that morning, uh, and it lasted about six, seven hours, and we, we all felt exactly the same. And, uh, it was quite, quite bizarre, really, because uh, there was no, there was no reason for it. It was just, yeah. just the way it was. Um, yeah. Got to go back to what you were saying about uh, universities. Uh, somebody's put in the chat box here. Um, my twenty-three-year-old university-educated niece only just found out that a penguin was a bird and not a fish. I mean, that, that says it all, really, doesn't it? I mean, well, yeah, 
it's got feathers for God's sake. I mean, <laughs> well, that's it. I mean, it's yeah. But the thing is, universities are, are very much like bureaucracies, very much and very similar to bureaucracies. Uh, they're politically correct. If you want to be a bureaucrat, you, you, you very quickly learn the ropes, what to say, what not to say, what not to ask, etc. It's more, it's more a sense of learning not what to ask, as opposing, you know, anything else. And universities are the same way. You want to get up the ladder, you must be completely politically correct, uh, say all the right things, um, and never criticize the things which are taboo. I never even asked the questions about things that are taboo. And, and nothing should be like taboo in a university anyway, but of course it is, because everything is politicized, everything. Especially even science is completely politicized. So you find that um, in, in universities, it's just a bureaucratic mindset. And, and a bureaucrat from the States told me this. He said, uh, he says, he says, bureaucracies for government or universities go around corners on, on, on square wheels. In other words, once something's set in stone, it takes forever for them to change their policies on anything. You know? So you'll find the same. I mean, I know guys who are biochemists, top biochemists, and, and they're doing the same experiments for year after year after year as, as people did 50 years ago. The same experiments, cutting things up, same things up, coming to the same conclusions, and so on and so on and so on. And, and they're all saying, well, what on earth is it for? It's padding for your course mainly. It's also desensitizing the person who's killing all the, the experimental animals because, uh, and one of them actually caught on to that, that I know, it depersonalizes, desensitizes you to killing. And all these animals that are using experiments are always killed afterwards. That's the law, you know. So you find that the universities are very selective for the type of person they want to push up above in a certain area uh, and if you, for instance, if you're very good at, at experimentation with these animals over and over and over again, you don't complain about it. You don't mind getting told to kill 50 monkeys off that day or whatever it happens to be. Uh, then, then you'll be selected to go to a, a higher group, and then you're into working for the Pentagon or the military or some kind, of, something to do with uh, super bugs that you're man create, man made, etc. Because you don't, you're psychopathic in a sense. That's that's how. They, so in the university, they select the types of people they want to push up to the higher level of reality that runs the world. The ones down below might get a job somewhere else, but uh, they, they select these types to go in. The ones who have got psychopathic traits, and they actually do have psychopathic traits. Yeah, yeah there, there was a case there uh, three, four weeks ago in, in uh, one of the newspapers uh, where some teacher was cutting up. Uh, I think it was a, it was a goat or something. And she, she was dissecting it on the table in front of these um, mothers and children. And the children were only five, six years old. They weren't, um, you know, university students or anything. And, and the faces of the children said it all. I mean, they, they were burying their heads in their, in their jumpers and all this stuff. But they were they were made to sit there and watch this stuff. And uh, I don't know what the parents are thinking of. I, I don't know why the parents are sitting there putting up with it. But um, they are. They, they are because they've been trained too to keep out of it. Uh, they've been trained that the school somehow has, has the, the right and authority to help bring up your child. And it doesn't. That all started about the 1960s. Before that, I'm telling you, even in the 60s, uh, if, some, if some teacher w was going overboard with a strap at the school at that time or anything like that, you would have seen a, a mob of the people, the parents coming up there, and that teacher would be sweating and running for it. Well, even in my time. And, and they, they reversed that whole thing until the, the school has authority. It's not a service anymore. It's an authority. Just like the health service became a health authority. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Even in my, that was even in my era. Uh, I, left, I left school at uh, 15 in 1979, but uh, even back in, I suppose, 70, 73, 74, it was, it was still like that. If, if the teacher went overboard, as you say, then the parents would be down there dragging them out of the, out of the class. Absolutely, you know, and uh, they would put up with it. But yeah. um, the, the parents now, uh, they just seem to to yeah, allow. Parents, parents are, are, have become what what uh, uh, Bertrand Russell said with his experimental schools. He says, eventually, their only role will be to provide. They'll be economic providers. That's that would be the only role they have. The state will give the child the new rules uh, through uh, plus plus. Uh, uh, um, uh, entertainment, they give them their new state rules and, and, and so on and they have a completely different value system than the parents. There would be very little communication involvement with the parents to the child. That's happened a while ago. Yeah. 
yeah, and the, and the parents pay for the upkeep, and uh, and that's it. Basically, they, they house them and they clothe them and feed them. Yeah. Um, we've only we've got about three minutes left. Um, it, is there any way of reversing this? I mean, I know it's a it's a huge issue uh, in terms of education, in terms of um, the well, everything, everything to do with uh, the role of parents, children. Uh, how how do we even attempt to start rolling it back? To attempt to start rolling it back would be incredibly difficult because there's not a person that hasn't been tainted with their indoctrination out there. Uh, you can escape it to a great extent. You've still gone through it. Um, you'll find, even for those who think they're, they're maybe, uh, this term I hate, it's like waking up, but uh, they'll say they're waking up or, or they've woken up, have still certain parts of the new system uh, which they like, they don't want to let go of, for, you know. Um, so you can't get the, the full resolve amongst people uh, with, with co- again, the commonality of their own situations, that there's, so, there's, a, there's differences in the commonality with each other now, that there's the breakups of the family, that there's, that there's the lack of, of... Actually, the parent has been disenfranchised from the child. It, 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 when, the, when the authorities come for them, they, they, they grovel in fear to the authorities, and uh, they don't feel like a, a person with authority over their own child in the face of the state anymore. They've been trained. They've all been trained. How do you undo that? Uh, how do you take power back? You, you, you have to. You have to have a, a specific percentage all doing it at the same time. They just studied years, studies years ago, and they found out that uh, for government, and they found out that um, for any particular thing that, that that the government wanted to do, which is always to get more out of you and more power over you, etc. Um, the, the, if 30% of the public said no, whether to income tax or anything else, then the government would have to dissolve it, couldn't deal with it. It's too much, that magic number of 30%. But to get to 30% of the public today to agree on most things that you'd have to agree on just to get something done is very, very difficult, as you know. Well, I suppose at least it's a target. <laughs> it's a target, and... and it, that, that, here's the thing too I mean the whole study of revolution is incredibly uh, amazing the amount of wealth of revolutions done by, the, by those who presently rule it by the way these were the revolutionaries of the past for those who don't know it they came in with the money they came in with the system of usury compound interest, took things over became the aristocracy etc 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 this is an old old thing well documented and so they have they have screeds of stuff on revolution, how it works, etc. Because they had to create revolutions across the world, get the peasants to to to, to revolt for them, and and then they could dominate the peasant. Um, so revolution is so well documented that they have all the data on on the things that have to be done to make it actually work. People tend to ignore all that stuff, but it's it's out there. The stuff is out there. You have to read their you have to read the Frankfurt School stuff. See how they were using the techniques to get to where they are today. If, of course, they evolved their names from the Frankfurt School onwards, but they're still around and very big. Uh, but um, you have to study their, their own own techniques of... of, of you, uh, they, they use people. They, the whole point was to use everybody so they could become dominant to the dominant minority. And it worked awfully well. But today, um, here's the thing which they did say in their own findings of revolution. They said there would never be another communist-type Marxist revolution anymore because they said that when they, when, they, when they could get the peasants all stirred up it was because the peasants were financially strapped they were uh, very hungry a lot of them a lot of them were living in misery uh, and they, you could motivate them but today's poor uh, this is what they brought in what they call socialism and big welfare states which the banks run because they get all the money off it from governments lent, borrowing money to pay you see um, it won't happen today because even the poorest person has his iPhone, his cheap entertainment, etc., etc., etc. So, so they, they're constantly doing studies to make sure they can hold on to power. You know. Yeah, uh, and, you know, I, I often think uh, I'm, it's about time to let you go, but I often think uh, possibly the best thing that could happen is the power just goes off and people have to start getting back to living life as they're supposed to and uh, start again, really. But um, that brings its own problems, of course. 
Um, well, you would, you would literally need something that happened outside their control, uh, outside anybody's control, to start over again. I, th- I think that's probably how, how, how it would have to be, yeah. Okay, well, um, thanks very much for your time again, Alan, and um, look forward to talking to you again next month. Sure enough, it's been a pleasure, yeah. Okay, thank you very much.